Hello and welcome to this week's video. Sorry Valerie, no little hop at the start of this one. I just got a bit carried away with myself and decided, well I don't know what I decided, but I found myself seeing if I could do the whole thing in one take. Saves hours editing, although this is about an hour long, so you may want to fast forward if you want. I decided not to speed up any of the footage in case any of you found it comforting to watch the whole thing. Now this is a piece of sycamore gifted to me from the lovely Mr Ed Oliver. It looks to me like a quite fast grown piece of sycamore, quite wide um, growth rings on it, grain quite uh, open and a lovely knot revealed itself right in the centre of things. In order to mount it on the lathe, I drilled a 69 millimetre hole on the other side and, in, and have then expanded my Axminster seed jaws into it. I'm going chunky. It just felt like the right thing to do. I think partly because the grain was so wide on this, it didn't feel to me like a fine, um, thin uh, piece of wood turning was going to come out of this. Using a 3 8 bowl gouge, I'm just going for a gradual curve round the outside and I'll make a foot uh, with a recess in it with some texture in it as well. You can see it bouncing around uh, quite a bit. The cut is reasonably good but there is a knot now emerging um, on the outside which is making it jump around a bit more than I would have expected it to given the amount of turning that it's already had. So flattening off the bottom now just trying to get the cut even and smooth although I do need to resort to a scraper a little later on but I don't know I quite like using a scraper. For the final shaping, of course, just the very, very fine final shaping, especially for skipping over the little knotty bits. I know I could use the bowl gouge in a scraping mode. I could put it over on its other side, drop the handle and use a sheer scraping cut. But the heft of the scraper that I've got, which actually came to me as a large skew chisel, um, really absorbs any knocks as it's going over the knot much more than my bowl gouge does. There you go, there was a little knot on the side there. So it's just a case now of getting that shape worked on, uh, trying to keep as much of the diameter as possible, but seeing how much of that knot I could also remove. Um, in the end I did have to resort to putting a bit of glue in, super glue, CA glue, and filling it with a little bit of dust, although I'm quite impatient. Have you noticed that about me? Or is it just something I've kept hidden and secret from everyone all these years? So I probably could have done a better job of filling in the gap. But this turning today really was playtime. So you can see I'm refining the shape. I don't mind taking a few cuts to get the shape broadly established and then sweeping round with a finishing cut or two but you can see there's quite a lot of tool marks here mainly because it's bouncing over that ridiculous annoying knot and quite a bit of tear out on that end of the end grain as well it's amazing what 120 grit sandpaper will get rid of but I want to focus now on getting getting the shape a bit smoother a bit more flowing the foot looking at it now I think is a little large. I do trim it down a bit um, in a few moments. But I can just lose myself filling my arms with shavings. And there's something to be said for reducing a whole blank to a peat pile of shavings. Really get to learn your tool control, learn how the cuts work. So especially if you're a beginner, don't always think that you have to finish a project and have, here is a bowl I've made. Um, you know, people learning any kind of craft or skill or art, there's an apprenticeship to be served, isn't there? So 
this is what I mean about, you know, using the uh, lower wing in a sort of sheer scraping mode. You can see it's doing a reasonable job of getting rid of those ugly ridges that you can see or could see so clearly on the right hand side of the bowl as we're looking at it. And it's a case of not moving the tool, but moving your body. Um, as you saw me doing just then. Always keep stopping the lathe, looking at what your work looks like, looking at the finish you're getting, looking at the cut you're getting. And there's that knot that's going to need a bit of filling. But now it's a case of getting the foot a bit more suitable for the size of the blank. And that to me looks a lot better. If I were doing a deeper bowl, I might rethink the way I finish the bottom. But this is my standard finish, a foot with a recess in. And on this recess, as I say, I'll be using the texturing tool. Right, that does need a bit of attention. I was humming and hawing about completely texturing the outside, making it um, a feature, thinking, well, if I can't hide that great big knot um, in plain sight with the wood being smooth around it, why not get my proxon out and just texture it to bits? Well, I decided against that. I think I wanted something smooth today. Oh, what's that we hear? The sound of a CBN wheel. What could it be sharpening? Hurrah! My large square scraper. So just getting the tool rest in the right position. So I'm cutting at about center or just above. No, just below. Get it the right way around, Stuart. It's just above on the inside, just below on the outside. And the reason for that is if you do get a dig in, there's space for the scraper to move into if it's below centre. If it's above centre, there isn't any air beneath it. Just more bowl blank. You can see I was a little heavy handed, but this sycamore cut very nicely. Really quite soft, uh, lovely soft ribbony shavings were coming off. So soon got rid of that ridge that I'd introduced with the scraper there, which was not a very attractive feature. So what I'm going for here, if I can stop myself just covering myself in ribbons of shavings, which is addictive, is a complete curve from the foot all the way to the rim. And I'm actually turning it in just a little bit at the top. I think that makes it more pleasing to the eye, but you may disagree. So that did a reasonable job of uh, removing the tool marks. The heavier tool was good for getting over that knot. Um, but there's still a bit of work to be done when I get onto the sanding. Now, there was some tear out on the end grain here as well. So I was using much lighter pressure. You can see the shavings are finer, not so much weight behind the tool. They're not going quite as far. Um, and that did make a big difference to the tear out that I'd introduced. But that knot, all those holes, cracks in it. If it's left untreated, it, potential for it to open a bit more when it comes indoors. But we'll, uh, we'll see how I get around that. This is quite possibly the longest voiceover I've ever had to do. And I'm having to do this in one take as well just because of the ridiculous standards I set myself. So here I am cutting the recess. It's a little parting tool and I always guesstimate this. I think this worked out at being just about 62 millimetres when I finally get the ruler on it. Here we go. You can't see it possibly, but just over 60. It needs to be 69. Although I think in their catalogue, Axminster now, uh, say that these jaws, the C jaws, expand into a 70 millimeter recess. So I've roughly got that to, to that with the parting tool, not quite to size yet because I'll use a skew to put the dovetail angle on. And now just cleaning out the inside with a bowl gouge. 
and that getting the little pip off in the middle there. If I stop it long enough, you might be able to see that there was a bit of tear out um, on the end grain in there. It didn't bother me too much. I didn't sand. I just textured all of that away. The texturing tool I'm using is the Robert Sorby texturing tool, the large one. But that's going to come out after I've put the dovetail angle on with my skew chisel. And I'm just taking a millimetre or so off and running along the bottom, just making sure it's flat there. There I am stroking the lovely tear out. I can't quite see it uh, on the monitoring screen that I'm doing the voiceover on, but uh, I'm sure it's there. Pull the tool, re tool rest back a bit so that there's room for the wheel to spin without hitting it. And then it's just a case of making several passes uh, from the outs, from towards the outside, from the centre. If this is something you're going to have a go at, do take care that you don't go right to the edge and start texturing the edge of your recess because it will look very ragged and very messy quite quickly. Then you'll need to tidy that up. The other thing to bear in mind with the design of the foot is that it should slant inwards. So the widest part of it should be higher than the centre or that part of it, which is closest to the centre so that it'll sit nice and uh, flat on the table, won't have a rock on it. So it sits on the outside edge of that foot. Now, there's another area that was a little hard um, once the sanding has been done, just on the outside of the foot, a bit of torn grain there. And I very, very, very lazily textured over that. But before we get to the texturing, I do need to get some glue in there. I could have taken it off the lathe. It may have been better to have done that to stop the glue running everywhere. But I protected the lathe beds with a bit of board, squeezed the glue in and uh, it, it does run a little bit. It's thin CA, this one. There we go. And then I just take a handful of shavings and rub it in. So it's not the not the best way of filling a gap. If you want something a bit nicer looking, then I would recommend mixing up some five minute epoxy. You can mix that with sawdust or metal filler powders, brass, gold, not real gold, copper, turquoise, all sorts of colors available and force that into the gaps. Give it time to set and then sand it flush. But this did a reasonable enough job of filling in. Now we come to the bit of the project that everyone loves watching, the sanding. The sh streamers of shavings had gone everywhere and covered up my nice clean bench. I'm just swapping over from my face mask now to my trend, what's it called, Pro Air Shield. I do need to get a new battery for this though, because unfortunately my battery doesn't hold very much charge anymore. So you can't see it, but I've got breathing protection on. I'm using the Simon Hope uh, 47 millimeter arbors, quick change ones, one for each grit. And I'm starting off at 120 and I've got my dust extractor on as well, which deals with some of the dust, but not all of it. So I'm making sure that I'm getting the edge of the sandpaper, not the whole pad and concentrating on the foot first and then working my way around the outside of the bowl. Now I could be kind and tell you how long the sanding goes on for. So if you're bored of watching it, you could skip forward. But um, I'm sure I can find some fascinating things to say about the sanding if you want to watch it all. Um, yes, maybe that is a bit of a challenge. You can see quite a bit of the dust is going into the extractor. Um, but really, the vacuum type extractors, they're great for hoovering the floor. 
the chip extractors that move a greater volume of air might suck the dust in more readily, but they don't filter to the same uh, small microns as the vacuum does. But it, this is something I think I really do need to work on. So 120 grit, as I said, working around the outside, right the way to the top. I haven't bothered sanding the texture, although I will use some cut and polish on it. I generally tend to go to 220 grit with my sanding when I'm going to use cut and polish, but on this I went a bit higher. The reason for sanding there with the lathe stationary and using the bottom of the pad was that it was going to be in line with the grain. There was a little bit of tear out there that the scraper hadn't really done a good enough job of removing. One thing you, you probably wouldn't have noticed is that you'll know if you're, if you're sanding it properly, you'll have slightly curved sanding marks in there which obviously come from the rotation of the of the pad. Next grit, so 180 and keep working until I've removed all of the 120 scratches and replace them with the 180 scratches. There is a new Arbor design, a bit more solid than this one that Simon Hope has brought out recently. Um, I've used it in one or two of my other videos but I only have one sanding head for that um, and it's so convenient changing the whole sanding head that it might be a while before I upgrade. Again, like with the turning, when you're sanding, keep stopping, having a look, see what areas are being sanded properly, which areas aren't. And you may have noticed me there just rubbing my finger against the edge of the foot. It was, that was where there was some some nasty grain left a remnant really from the the extent of the of the knot so keep the sandpaper moving keep the drill moving don't be sanding stationary in one place for too long or for any length of time really um, it may not look like i'm moving the drill pad all very much but it is being moved all the time even even if it's just the angle of presentation on the wood. Obviously areas where the whole pad is in contact, like the foot there is not, not so bad, but if you were to just sand in one place and keep it stationary, you will change the shape, certainly with these early grits. They're looking pretty good from here, but I can still see, you can see me pointing it there with how right at the edge of the foot there, I haven't done a very good job. One way I do sometimes get rid of if any tear out if it's there is to get the tool rest very close and use a 3 8 spindle gouge freshly sharpened. Um, the, uh, the angle is better on a spindle gouge to get in there and, and do a very fine cut. You can actually also do a very fine sort of shearing scrape. But in my impatience, I've gone for a bit of texture just a small area it sort of acts as a nice balance to the texturing on the inside of the foot and then I like to delineate it with a line which I'll put in with a needlessly bought point tool you don't have to have a point tool you could use a small spindle gouge you could use the toe of a skew chisel as well but well the slope the slope what can I say Buying things I think I need, or buying things I think I want, but could do without. Um, if you've never bought a tool that you didn't need and just wanted, then leave a gloating comment below. Right, so 20 minutes in and pretty much the outside is, is done now. Here's my little point tool, just putting a little point in there and it does raise a little burr but that'll get taken care of with the with the cut and polish which is coming next there was almost a bit of ripple in this sycamore which was very pleasing but unfortunately on the top it all gets covered up 
uh, just removing some of the sanding dust. Quite a lot of it had got it pushed into that dovetail in the recess. Could blow it out, but then it fills the air up with the dust, so I prefer to vacuum. And then cut and polish. There we go, pop the lid open. And where have I gone? I'm picking up a bit of um, safety cloth. Oh no, I went with kitchen roll. Kitchen roll this time. Now it's good to get a nice good coat of this on. I don't put so much over the texture because it's quite hard to get it out of the texture. Although I do have a grubby little toothbrush that you'll see me using later and that will get rid of, of most of it. It was relatively absorbent, the sycamore, so it did take it in quite a bit. But I think you can see there a little hint of ripple. Oh, gone now because I've moved the wood round. So once it's rubbed in, give it a moment to um, settle some of the solvent to go. I can't quite let myself leave a whole minute. I think that's a kind of impatience I may have inherited from my father. So there we go. You've seen me do this before, holding the cloth against it, moving it to the outside edge. Watch the way the shine is brought on. You can see that there reflected in the top with the lights overhead above the lathe. Keep it moving and keep turning to a fresh piece of cloth, holding the pad against it. And as, as you're removing more of the cut and polish, then you can put the speed up if you've got variable speed on your lathe. It's a wonderful luxury to have especially if you're working on wood, not so much like this, but lumps of wood that aren't quite so well balanced as blanks that have been cut to size. So just a nice little rub, working until the cloth comes off completely clean and supporting one hand with the other gives you a much more stable um, platform to work from. So that's got a nice soft sheen, which is what I really like when it's natural wood. I think I'm about to find my toothbrush and put a nice little um, dirty grubby mark on it from the toothbrush, but it does wear itself off once I run it under speed. Don't use a dirty toothbrush, there you go. Look at that grubby little mark he put in there. What a fool! Yes, think about cleaning it now, but it's a bit too late. Anyway, running the toothbrush around, much better with a clean one, and that will get your cut and polish worked into your uh, texture. Otherwise, it'll have a much paler finish to it. Well, no finish to it. So the recess I keep, if, if I were to sell this, I might remount it. I've got a Longworth chuck that's nice and easy to do that with. And then I could um, just reverse the dovetail angle on there. And that, that would satisfy the bottom aficionados who don't want there to be any remnants left of, oh, this must have been how it was held in a chuck. Now on to the top. And uh, again, still using my 3.8 Sorby Spin, uh, bowl gouge with a fingernail grind. I do love the spirally shavings that are coming off. That's a sign that it's nice and sharp and cutting nicely. Uh, always cut the rim so that it slants in slightly. And while I'm doing this, I'm bearing in mind, well, I've gone for a chunky look. How chunky do I want it to be? How... How big is the opening in the centre going to be? Probably, I think I end up something about this size. But uh, unfortunately, there's a knot, the knot from the bottom. <laughs> well, it has to come out somewhere and it comes out on the top. So that's why my sheer scraping with the lower wing there wasn't terribly successful. So I'm just going for flattening the top 
so I can decide where I'm going to start going in. Now I'm off to do a bowl turning course with Les Thorne soon and one of the aspects we're going to be looking at there is using a 60 degree bowl gouge. I've had an old bowl gouge that I've tried various grinds on and never really got on with and uh, so I've ground it to 60 degrees to see how that works. I don't think I got it very sharp but look there's another knot there. Drats. Honestly. There we go. So here's my my bowl gouge with a 60 degree just giving it a go. It cuts not quite so aggressively as the fingernail grind. I remember the first time I used a fingernail grind it was amazing. Great big huge shavings coming off. So this is taking me back to when I began turning bowls and I had a hmm, what is it? A not a three eight, a quarter inch bowl gouge with a traditional 45 degree grind on. This as I say I've put a 60 degree grind on which is supposed to make it easier to get round the corner. Not that this is a particularly deep bowl but I just thought I'd give it a go. But one thing I do want to make sure about is that when cutting the bowl part that it is a continuous curve. It doesn't matter if you can't swing it round all in one go especially when you're getting used to a new grind that might be a bit of a problem unless you're a natural turning genius which I'm not. Shock horror don't tell anyone. So to get that continuous curve it's swinging the tool round moving it forward all the time. I don't mind leaving a little bump in the middle there but there you can see the knot. So coming through from the bottom again. I'll do a rudimentary filling of that as well just for the sake of um, trying to smooth it off. So last few uh, cuts making the opening a little bit bigger. No point having it so small it can't be used for anything and then just swinging the handle round. So this is quite different from shaping the outside where you're keeping the tool still and moving your body. In order to get that continuous curve because your bed bars are in the way of course you've got to swing the tool and use, use your arms. So just making sure that that bottom part is going to be curved all the way in. And again always check your turning with your fingers you'll feel it better than you'll see it. If I think think if I've got a motto for judging how well you've done a bit of shaping that would be it. Your eyes can deceive you but your fingers can't. Now obviously if you were turning these out by the dozen you might take longer than well it took about an hour. So we're only halfway there folks. But if you're doing it for fun or relaxation, having a bit of creative time in your shed, then there's no need to bash these out in 20 minutes or so. Now I normally don't hollow out until I've done the rim, but I think I was just keen to try out that gouge before I got the rim done. And it leads to, on to me to putting a bit of colour in the middle which I normally don't do. Now the sound of sharpening my round scraper this time just to remove any tool marks. If you're eagle-eyed you might see there's a little bump in the centre, there's a little, little line um, about an inch or so out which should be got rid of with the scraping. And remember when you're scraping on the inside you're cutting just above centre. So that way if you do get a catch it's got air to move into rather than hitting the bowl, the wood underneath the centre point. So that again that's done with a swinging, swinging of the handle. 
So you can see the bottom now has lost that little nub that was there. The little line that was there is gone. And I'm just going to use one part of this, uh, even though it's a curved edge, to make a straight edge. Just drifting that along. Quite light, you can see them on my hand there, quite soft the shavings coming off. It is mesmerising. It is something I could carry on doing for much longer than necessary. And then we're back to what you've all been waiting for, sanding round two. So get your tool rest out of the way. Um, this is a short bed lathe, so I find it easier to remove the tool rest completely sometimes, or to put the tool rest the other side of the bowl blank so it's completely out of the way. Dust extraction on and we're back to 120 grit. Now this took a little bit more sanding than the outside for some reason. Can't really explain why. Maybe I was just a bit heavy handed and put more scratches in than, than really needed to be put in. Again, this probably goes on for a few minutes, so skip forward if you've seen enough. One of the things, if you've not got the Simon Hope sanding pads, is you can see it's two colours. There's the blue foam and then on top of that there's a black uh, Velcro interface, a pad. You can get red ones which are softer and then the black ones which are a bit firmer. And they are replaceable. After a while, particularly at the edges, the hook and loop will, will wear away and they won't hold sandpaper as well as they did when they were fresh from the packet. So I always keep a few uh, spares in to hand for when that happens. So rather than buying a whole new pad, which is about seven pounds, you can just replace that interface, which is no more than a couple of pounds. Take care not to sand at great speed and then they will last a lot longer. And the other thing about having one pad for each grit is that each time you put the sanding pad on and off, you are degrading the, the fixing, the Velcro slightly. So that's the advantage of having a pad for each color. Although it may seem a bit extravagant at the time of purchase. So you can see another knot there, which I do put a bit of, bit of filler in a little later on. And there are some bits where you can see I'm using just one edge and that's roughly cutting in line with the grain. So I'm going with the grain, even though it's spinning round. And uh, those particular areas, just as you're coming out of the end grain, can be the areas where you get a bit of tear out on these bowls or platters. So you may find that it helps to do a little bit of localised sanding with the lathe off so that you can sand with the right part of the pad for the direction of the grain that you're working on. How many of you wish I'd edited this now? Just don't give me a thumbs down. Just fast forward. So that pretty much gets tool marks removed, gets the shape done, gets the sanding in and now I've got to get rid of those scratch lines from the 120. So move on to 180 grit now. I'm trying not to soften the rim too much. Um, I do want there to be a distinct end to the rim rather than it just softly going into the, into the centre. I like it that there's enough of a crisp edge for there to be a bit of shadow, which I've still managed to maintain just here. We'll see if that works for the whole, whole video. Maybe not. But again, like with the outside when you're sanding, keep the sand paper moving, keep the drill moving. The sandpaper, of course, is moving. Yeah, because it's spinning all the time. Don't dwell too much in the centre either of your bowl, otherwise you might change the shape of the curve, put a little bit of a 
depression in there and lose the smoothness of your curve that you've worked hard to achieve. So a bit of super glue, you'll see it run all down the rim. I think we've already probably talked enough about my laziness. Uh, I'm not sure it's curable. I'm not too bothered about it, to be honest. Uh, you could use finer shavings that would fill it better, but there's still a bit of glue in there, sanding now, and that'll help to fill it a little bit. But it's all going to get covered up by the end anyway. Now, get, getting to the edge there, on the outside edge, if I just sand it right across, I'm going to make a too crisp an edge. So you'll see me as well putting a, a little bit of an angle on there, a little very small chamfer, which will just soften that uh, hard edge. So if you're hearing, listening very closely, you can hear the beeping of my respirator. That battery's already gone. Must get it replaced. And again, doing a bit of localised sanding, especially over that knot there and on, a, on the end grain on the edge with the lathe turned off. Next grit, so I'm up to 240 now. And I generally sand to 240 when I'm going to put stains on, but I think on this I go another grit um, just to, to get it a bit smoother. But what you're seeing here is, I suppose, the relative amount of time for each operation. Uh, I've had blanks that haven't needed this much sanding, but I think again, like I said earlier on, this bit of sycamore seemed to have been a rather rapid growth, very wide gaps between its its rings and uh, perhaps a little coarser than, than I was used to. There we go, as, as you can see on the outside as well, not using the whole pad, but just the outside. And there are people who use three inch padge, padge, pads and then sharpen up, grind the teeth off and sharpen up a two inch hole saw and use that as a stamp to cut out the centre so that you get two pads for the price of one. Maybe I'll do that one day. So there we go, 320 grit. I think I needed to put a fresh pad on. I might do that in a moment and just a case of making sure that there are no tool marks left or no swirls left from the previous grit because they will show up under any finish and putting stain on will make them show up as well. You can't hide them with stain. You might be lucky and be able to hide them with paint if you uh, put paint on thick enough that it fills those ridges, grooves, whatever, however small they might be. But it's much better to get a very smooth finish before you think about putting any of your colouring on. Still bouncing around a bit on that knot. Again, I could do a better job of filling it. Do I have another go? No, it looks like I've decided I've got bored of listening to the beeping of my low battery warning. And so sanding with the Pro Shield on is over. So what comes next? Brushing off all the dust, of course. Uh, you don't want that there when, when you're sanding. And then a close inspection. There were still some swirls in it and I think it's because it was it was so soft. So just a bit of hand sanding with the grain. I've gone back to 240 grit for this. Um, and all of this is necessary. It might seem a bit long winded. But unless you get your surface flat and smooth, the colouring is going to reveal all those little scratches that are left. So I used the 220 just to tidy up the areas where it had been a little bit less than satisfactory. And from memory, because doing this voiceover in one take as well, 
in keeping with the title. From memory, I think I do go back to the drill and get that back to 320 grit. A bit more super glue in there. Try and fill it with a bit more dust before it runs out. You can, of course, remove the chuck from the lathe, keeping the blank in it so you've not lost uh, its central mounting or concentricity. And then your glue isn't going to dribble down your rim, which is not great, especially if you're not going to be putting colouring on, because sometimes the CA glue can fill the grain and and uh, make an obvious blemish when you get a finish on. But if I were to be taking more care, then I would take the chuck off, get it angled so that the glue wasn't going to run anywhere, but stay in those holes and then it would be easier to fill. Or as I said, on the outside, mix up some epoxy. So back to the drill just to remove any 220 grit sanding marks from that hand sanding. You can see, I think from my arm there, how, how dusty it is, even with the extractor on. So do make sure that you're wearing a mask as well as having extraction on because it's not all going to get taken up by your extractor. So if you were to turn this turning video into a pie chart, I think the largest segment must be for sanding. And there we are. That is it. That is done. So now I've got to think about colouring. Now you may have seen me use my favourite colour, which is chestnut blue spirit stain, but on a lot of woods, because because of the, the colour of the wood, sometimes because of tannin in the wood, that lovely blue ends up a sort of greeny colour. So rather like I did with intrinsic colours a few videos back, I'm actually going to start off with some white, putting this on with a bit of um, finishing cloth. That's smoother than kitchen roll. So the white, it doesn't quite I'd well it would cover it solidly if I let it dry long enough and put enough coats on um, but you can see there it sits nicely on the top definitely is doing a job of preparing the base I'm patient enough to let it dry for a few moments it does dry very quickly the spirit stain uh, what I should have done of course is put some gloves on it's that old impatience thing, just getting on with it. And pretty soon I realised that I've got it all over my fingers, like you can see there. But hopefully you can see that the first coat has dried a bit, the second coat is going on more solid. And the reason for putting this on is just to stop the, the colours being affected by the wood. I've said a few times before, there's some shellac in the colour, so that does act as a sealer. Uh, now, after the horse has bolted, on come the gloves. But at least there's only white stain to remove. It was at this point I finally decided what I was going to do. I was thinking of doing some stenciling over it, um, but I decided actually I'm just going to do lines of colour. But um, to get those to sit better, the time it took to put the gloves on, the white stain has dried again and I can get a, another coat on and you can see that it's much more solid now. You can also see the shine that gets built up. The first coat or two of colour will soak in, be absorbed by the wood, that's what stains do. But now a bit more of it is going to be sitting on top of the layers of stain beneath it and build up a little bit of a shine. So just wiping that round, making sure all of the application lines are uh, concentric rather than pulling off to, to the side with the grain. Putting my vapour mask on now 
which is important to wear when you're airbrushing or using any aerosols. A dust mask isn't enough. Ah, the lovely comforting sound. The lovely comforting sound of my compressor coming on. So, uh, wait for that to die down. It really isn't very pleasant a sound. Just have to put up with it. And here we go, putting the colour on. My Nan, I had two Nans, Big Nan and Little Nan. And Little Nan had a lot of um, pottery that was just white and blue. And that's kind of what came to mind. When I was putting this first bit of colour on. So this is Chestnut Royal Blue. And holding the nozzle really quite close so that I'm getting intense colour and a very thin band. Going over it just to strengthen it. And it's really quite satisfying watching that line darken and get a little bit thicker. And I hummed and hard and you know, is that enough? Should I stop there? Or should I go for some more colours? What do you think happened? I think probably I've only managed to limit myself to two colours once. And as I coloured it white so that the blue would show to better effect, here, here it comes. So this is the the blue and look at that staying blue not going green lovely it's not got the vibrancy that I want yet but that comes with building up there we go nearly all of that outside edge done and now for going on the inside stop and have a look now you can see around the edge of the blue on that far the outer ring there are some little splatters where I was turning it too fast putting too much on but I can deal with that a little bit later on so now it's just a case of not getting put off by the loud burst of the compressor motor kicking in and ruining my lines but just working between the lines putting the blue on and then thinking about what color next well a bit of purple so i've gone for for the blues blues going into purple and then later i'll put a bit of black on and that purple on the outside there did a nice job of covering up the rather splodgy splattery uh, mess at the edge of course the colors are completely optional do whatever colors you like but I actually think it works better with several rather than than two colours. That was perhaps a little bit too uh, stark for what you've come to expect from me. So approaching the 50 minute mark. And it's almost done. There we go. Look how look how I didn't flinch when that compressor kicked in again. Now I quite like, as I've said on other videos, having the rim a bit darker to sort of give it a bit more definition. So that's why I've gone for such a the strong wide band of purple there. Now I hadn't decided to use black, but looking at it, I think at this point. I thought it needed some and I think the black helps to give a well definitely does give a stronger contrast gives a bit more definition to it as well so here we go 
Is this the black coming on now? Yes, it is. So a few couple of fine lines in that wide line of blue. And then maybe there on the rim, just to add to the sort of shadow effect and the distinction between the rim and the bowl part. And then a few black lines in the middle. You can really see that bringing the contrast up dramatically. And some right at the very edge as well. There. It's quite hard to actually see when it's spinning and when it's not. For this is this is the one type of airbrushing you can do where it will look the same when you turn it off. A bit of black right in the centre for a bit of dramatic effect. There we go. So pretty much there now. I normally don't colour the inside, but because of that rather poorly filled knot, I decided to go for it. And there you can see the shine that is being introduced as the colour, the stains, the layers of stain are building up. They're almost finishing themselves, but they will need sealing and they will need a finish. So they'll have a sealer over them, aerosol, acrylic sanding sealer, cut back with a very, very fine hand sand, uh, probably without any power on, just in case I go a bit too far and cut through the colour and have to start all over again. And then over the top of that, I'll use some acrylic gloss lacquer. I think this needs to be shiny rather than matte. And then last job is just strengthening that blue. So going over all the colours because it really won't change the other colours because they're all darker than this one. And there we go. Finished. Or have I? What am I doing? Turning off, finished. Having a look. Yeah. Well, if you've watched this all the way through and haven't been put to sleep by my voiceover, thank you, congratulations. You win the endurance badge from Stuart Farini Woodturning. It doesn't actually exist, but um, a virtual badge. Right, so there it, 53 minutes and 12 seconds, and we are done. As I say, apart from the finish. Well, all of that. A one take video. Uh, right, it's not finished because I've got to let this dry. I'm gonna let it dry a good couple of days, really. I don't want to lose any of the vibrancy of those colours. And if I put sanding sealer on it now, so much stain on there, it will just make it all run a little bit and dilute it. And I don't want that. I'm not sure if it's a keeper because of the great big knot in there, but golly, that was fun. Don't normally colour everything, but it felt right for this one. I'll get some stills up for you and uh, hope you found this interesting. Leave a comment below. If you're new here, please subscribe, please. And uh, don't forget to click the thumbs up. Share. Get me global. I'm not insecure and needy. Not at all. Until next time. Thanks for watching. The annoying thing about all of this was that I cleared out the workshop ready for a demo. Now I have to tidy it up all over again. <sighs> Ho hum! <laughs>